that actually 63% of TA say that talent shortage is their biggest issue, right? So actually finding the skills out there is their biggest issue. 76% of hiring managers just know that attracting the right level of candidate is their greatest, it's their biggest challenge. We know that 75% of people interested in won't take a role with a company that has a poor reputation. And we also know that the very best candidates are off the market within about 10 days. And so it's really interesting, I think, that although the stats back up all of our experiences, that actually internally what tends to happen when we experience some of the shortages, when we experience the difficulty of recruiting the right level of candidates, what tends to happen is, is that we look to maybe up level in terms of advertising spend. We maybe look to increase the, the external spend with agencies or we look to increase the spend with job boards. And actually, fundamentally, some of the behaviours that, that we really need to look at, first of all, are actually what are our recruiters doing to work in a world-class way, manner, process, what are they doing to make sure that at each point of the recruitment stage, they are working as critically, as sensitively, as professionally as they possibly could do? Now, it might well be that we've got people within our teams who actually do a sterling job, who've been doing the job for years and are actually really experienced. And in my lived experience, I know that when you sit desk side with those individuals, what they've probably got is a very good understanding of the business, a very good understanding of the hiring manager expectations, and they've probably also got the talent pipelines. Interestingly, there's still work that we can do to help those individuals to, again, up level their core behaviours. And that might be things around Boolean sourcing. It might be to really look at and actually review their processes. And then when we step back a few stages and we go to the first few months of recruiting our TAs, oftentimes what happens is that the legacy and the way that we operate in a business is normally dependent upon the last person who was doing the job or we feed those processes and those behaviours through the team. And ultimately, inevitably, something gets missed. And it's in those areas, it's in the grey areas that we find that those processes start to just diminish things a little bit. And we find that we are not necessarily following every single part of the core process and, and those behaviours. And I can just actually see in the chat that we've got some responses in terms of um, numbers. So um, I'm just going to go back back to these. So this is interesting, actually, really interesting. Um, I don't know, Hayley, if you can see this chat as well. Um, but we can see that Laura Taylor's saying it's a proxy, it's about 400 a year. And there's there's two individuals in the team. So that's that's a fairly hefty weight. Um, Jen's saying, look, we're a relatively small startup, but we hire around 40 um, full time each year, which, again, is, is still, you know, these are decent numbers. Mm -hmm. Um Dan is saying that we've got an operational team of 400 and head offs of 35. So it's a real mix of hospitality and corporate roles. Charlotte's saying somewhere between three and 500. Rich is saying around 400. Um, hello from the Totally Group. Hello. Annual numbers are around 300, clinical and non-clinical. Uh, Nicole's saying that last year it was around 3,000. Jen's saying somewhere between 800 and 900. So part of, part of being able to deliver the operational requirements is to actually be able to go right the way back to and actually really look at what are our TAs doing? What's the recruitment team doing to achieve the very best result right the way along the process? And thanks, Michaela. I can see that you've just chimed in there about three and a half, 3,600 across a team of, of 35. And so the work that Reggie and Recruiters does is to look at how do we make sure that we're in a position whereby each part of the recruiting process is being followed. And I guess the way that we do that is not just through data insights, but it's also to understand your, your core challenges. And I think, um, Natasha, you may well have, um, you may well actually have a poll that's around to ask everybody what their core challenges are. And I think as people are looking at this poll, it'd be really interesting, Hayley, if you wouldn't mind just talking about some of the, there we go. So the poll should have come up on the screen that's asking about your, your core challenges. And don't get me wrong, I couldn't, you know, I know there will be other nuances and what I couldn't do in a poll is necessarily get every single one. But what I've tried to do is put kind of the top eight or nine. So please feel free in there to, to give your responses. And in the meantime, I'm interested to know, Hayley, what are some of the challenges that, that you and your team have found I think uh, it links back to, to a point that you were just making there Joe. I would say over the last 18 months two years my team we've been through uh, a lot of restructuring a lot of growth as a team we found coming out of the pandemic we had massively varying skill and competence levels across those recruiters so some of those individuals 
understandably been hired, inducted and, and were working fully remotely during the pandemic. So we found that some of our recruiters were working quite transactionally, almost to the point of, of just providing an admin service. So, I mean, having worked within recruitment myself for, for over a decade, I had a really clear vision around what I wanted our standardised process to look like. But as you said, you know, some of those individuals were, were picking up habits and, and experience from people who had been in the roles for longer, which, which weren't necessarily working in the most effective way. So I had all of those kind of documented process flows and, and um, everything to, to back up how I wanted the team to be working, you know, really, really sexy side of, um, of recruitment. But joking aside, what I needed was someone to, to bring to life for our recruiters how we wanted that process to look because we did have some I guess some real development areas within the team in relation to direct sourcing candidates I think managing hiring managers expectations was another one so those interpersonal skills and, and developing that and really being seen as a partner to the business as well so so for them to fully understand actually what we do within our operations and then also develop new skills to be able to bring that to life and, and sell that to candidates as it were. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. That's interesting. So the poll results have come back. And um, if I look at the the kind of the highest results, uh, what's interesting is that the biggest challenge is that 34 percent have said, look, pushing for quality hiring in a challenging market. And then um, kind of closest to that would be the expectation or managing those expectation of hiring managers. And then um, and 17 percent have said, look, it's all of the above. It's, it's the whole lot. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the chances of me being able to get through and give away all of the all of the um, data and the information and how we how we run the training um, is remote in the next kind of 25 minutes but what we can do is we can go to some of the programs that we offer that really answer some of these some of these questions and some of these core core challenges so before I do that it's probably worth me just um talking about you know one of the num the number one reason that people are motivated to move roles in 2023 and we know this from the data and from the research is career opportunities but oftentimes to Haley's point about business partnering oftentimes TA recruiters are not viewed or seen as a business partner and as a consequence of that their actions our behaviors our approach means that we are less confident less likely to push back with a hiring manager less likely to ask the relevant questions around the role so that we can really go to market And when we do go to market we go to market with the evp right the employee value proposition we go there with the all of the information that's central to that one particular position and yes we might be recruiting multiple positions around the same title but equally we'll be dealing with a number of unique roles and really this understanding as to what this role offers is core and it's central to being able to attract the right people for the role. But actually, the question is about, well, look, what's the confidence like? What's it really, what's the confidence really like? And how are we in a position to make sure that our recruiters are equipped um, to deal with every hiring manager? And it's interesting that Tori's just saying, like, I find it really interesting that the news reports again today that unemployment's gone up, number of vacancies are down by 47,000. Yeah, most recruiters I know are struggling with, with requirements and lack of candidates. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really interesting is, is that regardless as to the market, and I've worked across every market, you know, really high unemployment um, and low number of vacancies or really high vacancies and low number of the, the lot. And I think what's really interesting is, although there's a report that, yes, the unemployment's gone up, I wonder, I wonder what the data and the stats are that really belie that story um in as much as we know that day by day there's a, in certainly in terms of indeed and in terms of total jobs there's an there's an additional fifty five thousand jobs every day going up out there so i think it's interesting that whilst the stats tell us one thing actually our lived experience is very different so we've we've asked the question around around exactly what your requirements are and we're, and we're going to get to that and so in terms of what we offer there's eight different programs that we offer um, and these are all half day programs that we deliver they're face to face with a combination of online follow-ups and pre and post work 
And we deliver these across the course of a couple of months. So what we don't do is come in and deliver and take away time from take away that really core cool time from resourcing and, and sourcing people. But what we do do is deliver this in a structured fashion so that you find that your recruiters are really being able to get to the underbelly of the role and really go back to that fundamental strategy in terms of recruiting. So first, our first offering is a recruitment strategy meeting. So it's taking the role and managing the hiring manager expectations. The on-site meeting is next. So the on-site meeting actually really speaking to the recruiting and the hiring managers and understanding exactly what it is they need. There's another program that's about creating this advert and this winning advert, but also your social media campaigns and keeping that EDI piece in focus. So how do we recruit and make sure that we recruit across every level and that, that we really create this, this inclusivity from the get-go? Boolean sourcing is another program that's really popular. So how do we find those candidates that are underneath the iceberg tip, right? We don't want the candidates that are constantly being um, contacted by agencies. We want to be in a position whereby we can find those people that are very difficult to find. Um, and interestingly, do you know that candidates are now misspelling, their, um, misspelling on their CVs on purpose? They don't want to be found necessarily by recruiters who can find them the first time around, which is interesting. Um, we also deliver pre-screening. So how do we pre-screen when there's multiple CVs, championing CVs and really representing candidates effectively? Scheduling interviews and really organising those interviews with the hiring managers to get the best outcome. Gaining the relevant feedback for successful and proactive feedback. And how do we communicate the offer and overcome the counter offer and deal with those alternative offers? So we don't lose these cracking candidates when we get to offer start. And so I think when we come back to the poll, excuse me, one of the questions that that um, was raised was really, you know, how do we get the most out of our resourcing? How do we get into a position whereby we we can really elevate the number of people that, that we bring on board? Um, and, and actually, one of the first places to start is to really think about that, that recruitment strategy meeting. Um, and I think interestingly, when we when we think about bringing um, when we think about working with our hiring managers, one of the uh, in fact one of the the behaviours that we usually trace back to in the first instance is what was the conversation and what was the what was the management of that hiring manager and their expectation in the first instance? So how did we take the role from the hiring manager and actually what does that look like? to each individual hiring manager across the business and what's their experience of working with talent acquisition you know so if we took a role that was in one country and we took a role in another area um, of a different country what does that look like and is it the same because what we know is that if we haven't got a uniformed approach to taking the role down if we're not in a position whereby we've got various nudge documents and we're not in a position whereby we're really taking down quality information that's where that's where the the, uh, the actual process starts to fall apart. How many times, and again, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands, how many times you expected just to recruit from a job description? How many times you expected just to take down a role um, and go ahead and just recruit for it because you recruited for it three months ago or six months ago? So then there's an expectation that actually you haven't got to do any more or the hiring manager hasn't necessarily got time to speak to you. Um, so I'm going to ask for a show of hands there. But that is, if you can show hands, if not, then you can just uh, give me a yes in the chat. Here we go. And let's have a look. So, um, yeah, they're absolutely, um, Stefan, is it, it's a really good point. This partnering piece is a real perception that recruitment hasn't moved on and that it's transactional. And in fact, in many ways, it isn't. It really isn't. And Charlotte's putting her hands up saying, yeah, you know, oftentimes we're just expected to take the role. Um, and I'm going to go to Hayley and kind of ask, in terms of your, your recruiters, you you have such a mix of experience. You've got some individuals who've come from this recruiting background, right? And others who maybe have come from internally in the business. And I'm just interested to know what, what were your thoughts in terms of what came out of this particular session when we really deep dived and we focused on what is it we need from the hiring manager and how do we educate the hiring manager? I think for me, this was a really critical one. So we, we've always had the process in place where our teams take a verbal brief and they understand the requirements of the role, but it's going to that next level. So it's giving the time, that giving the team time to really focus on the additional skills that they might need to implement during this meeting, because it's not just, okay, we'll write down the job requirements and, and go away and perhaps try and find a unicorn. It is developing those additional skills that 
can be seen to develop that relationship further and build relationships further with sites, as, as you say, Joe. And I think we've always really encouraged our teams to go out and do these meetings in person on site as, as much as possible. And even more so, we're encouraging the team to do that so that they can build those relationships with stakeholders in person because as you say we've had varying levels of, of skill within our team um you know coming from an agency background myself you do tend to get a lot more structured formalized training during that onboarding process around you know business development influencing objection handling which are all still massively relevant for internal stakeholders so to give them that time to have build up those additional skills um has been you know tremendously well received and it also gives them that opportunity to, as I say, influence our stakeholders. So really be able to be seen as a partner and push back on our hiring managers, especially when we're discussing those essential versus would like to have requirements, which enables us to tap into a, a bigger candidate pool as well. And we've seen we, we use an internal measure, our net promoter score, which measure, measures our um, stakeholder satisfaction um, we've actually seen that increase by uh, 51 points um, following doing this session with uh, with Joe and with our with our um, uh, talent acquisition experts um, so really that partnering piece for me is is really really important and I think it's it's this piece whereby we, we may be a really experienced recruiter but actually we can lose a little bit of the um, enthusiasm. We can lose a little bit of this, this piece around, oh, I really want to get this right for the business because it's a hard job, right? It's a really tough job being internal, very visible. Everybody knows you, you're judged whether or not, you know, you're actually, your work is actually judged based on whether or not you find the right person, regardless of the, the number of external variables, right? There's so many different external variables. And I think, you know, part of actually investing in our teams and, and motivating them is finding a way to motivate individuals within the role and finding a way to have individuals really want to want to really be enthused about every single role. And I think, you know, Hayley, you and I have talked previously um, about how do you motivate these individuals who have really come from this recruiting background that was a meritocracy? How do you do it when we're not really delivering bonuses in this particular instance? Um, and I'm just interested to know your thoughts, really, in terms of in terms of, I guess, the positioning of the role. Yeah, I think for absolutely you've hit the nail on the head I think it's sometimes really difficult to keep internal talent teams motivated when we're not dangling a financial incentive and um, that's usually based around KPIs so I think doing things like additionally training the team is massively well received but so from from our perspective the team see that as an investment that we've made within them to help them to develop and progress um, so we're absolutely able to demonstrate the commitment that we've made to our team to help them for, for their own careers and you know hopefully the plus side for us means that we retain our talent whether that's within our resourcing function or actually within our wider business because you know continually developing those skills which are absolutely transferable to different parts of our business means that we can keep those those heads wherever they may go to in the business yeah absolutely absolutely I think you were saying to me you've had three or four internal transitions um, as well as a few internal promotions within our functions so yeah absolutely that's one of the things that I, I wholeheartedly can can say is we we massively promote progression and development within the team which I think you know you you can do that and people can buy into that without it having to have that initial monetary bonus or commission yeah. in place Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think a lot of the, the, a lot of the work that, that we did, certainly with the team, was all about, you know, this piece about third party perception. So we spent lots of time with teams within the activities really looking at actually, if I was a hiring manager, what would be my expectation of a recruiting partnership? And what would that need to look like? And what does real quality look like and a global standard look like? Mm -hmm. What's the service that I need? And we were, we were then able to work back from there in terms of really looking at actually, you know, what should this on-site meeting look like? And what's the information I need? And how do I then educate the hiring manager when I'm in front of them to make sure they understand what's going on in the local market, but also what's going on in terms of the wider market? You know, and I think I think one of the things that um, was really interesting is that it's it's easy to forget as a recruiter that actually hiring managers only hire for 10% of their time. 
we're the specialists, we're the business partners, we're the ones who can come along with the insight and the understanding. Um, and I think, you know, when we talked about the on-site, on-site meetings, there was a real need for um, for your recruiters to, to be out there again. And I think we were talking, weren't we, about the challenges of the hybrid working piece. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that actually, you know, when recruiters are really in the thick of it, being able and making the time to go out to site and really understand what site looks like and what the requirements are are important. But they're also important to be able to get out there and to be able to really talk about what some of the challenges might be with this role, but also benchmark it from a salary perspective, deliver data insights, but already be in a position whereby we've got a selection of people that we can take along to the hiring manager to really be able to be efficient in terms of who might be out there and also who's previously applied for other roles. So the on-site meeting piece is this half day opportunity to really look at what are the strategies I can give, I can actually give to my hiring manager and how can I manage that? And um, so Stefan's saying, would be good to get your insight on managing hiring managers' expectation during times of change, specifically restructures. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, let's go there. Let's go there just for a second. And I think, um, I think when we think about managing hiring managers' expectations, there's this, there is this need to put ourselves in a position, and, and I do think it's about positioning of ourselves within the business, and it's about being able to have data insights, and it's about being able to have examples, so real lived examples of what's going on across the rest of the business in terms of how they're managing that change, how some of the restructures, we know restructures will have an impact on, on the whole business, but actually where are the opportunities with this restructure and actually with restructures I think it's interesting that hiring managers can quite often put themselves in a position whereby in their mind's eye they're looking to recruit the same person as they had last time mm -hmm. they're very much looking for actually what I want is you know it needs to be needs to have exactly this experience needs to come from this background needs to have this education needs to be in this position um, whereby they've done exactly this role before and actually, it's about really being able to open their minds with different stories, different examples, data insights, so that hiring managers actually understand that we don't have to go down the same route that we've always gone down. And, and the reality bring... is with that as well, Joe, is that mm. someone potentially departing a role, the likelihood if you reflected back on a job description as to what that role the person should have been doing, it would look vastly different to what that person actually was doing. So I think it's really important to go back to the drawing board. We're not just looking for a copy paste of that person. That's when anyone leaves the role, whether that's during restructures, whether you're looking to completely change that structure or just replace a head, it's what do we need in this role to be effective so that you can manage that accordingly? Yeah, because you're not going to find an exact replica in the market. Of, of that person there would, that would have been a relationship built over years and, and changes and different things that person could have brought to the table and, yeah absolutely I think one of the analogies that I certainly tend to use is about you know the mobile phone contracts and the bolt-ons you know you get your mobile phone and then um, and then you get your bolt-ons you know do you want to pay for this do you want to pay for that da, 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 da. and actually within roles quite often what hiring managers have is this idea of bolt-ons like additional skills that they'd like somebody to have so yes I want I don't know for example I want a credit controller but I also want a credit controller who um, is in a position whereby they could also do some sales calls well hang on a second you know which what what is the role what are we actually looking for what is it we need um, and then I just saw another question come off on chat and it was about hang on that just flicked up did you see that flick up whoever yeah. just popped that question on who whichever the attendee was please feel free to flick it back up because it hasn't hasn't come back up um, and just whilst I wait for that um what's interesting again I think with advertisements for example is um and and some people might do this quite naturally but it's always interesting to ask the question particularly when I go desk side or in the classroom when we've loaded our advert we tend to load it through um various different portals we get this advert on and we get it out there but actually when we review the advert what does it look like from the mobile phone because often we, we know that candidates will only really apply to advertisements. Something like 86% of candidates actually apply through the phone. Well, what does the advert look like on the phone? And quite often when we go back to it, it's interesting to see that the EVP is nowhere in sight in the first couple of sentences on the phone. And that EVP, that employee value proposition, what do I get if I join the role, means that we're in a position whereby if we haven't got that, at the very top few sentences, then we're much less likely to be in a position whereby candidates actually click to see more. 
And I think some of the work, Hayley, that, that that we did was to really look at, okay, how do we balance what's required across the uh, the corporate structure for the adverts, but also what's required from a candidate perspective. And I don't know if you just want to talk to that point for a minute whilst I just have a look at Tories. Uh, Tories I was, I was actually back with just a point. reading uh, Tories, yeah. Tories' point there, and I, I was going to respond to that, Joe. just in, in terms of it would be really interesting to see how much of that time is spent doing what is actually set out within a job, descript- job description. And I think that's, that's relevant for roles that we're recruiting for, but equally important for the recruiters within our own team. And that's one of the things that we're continually looking at is, is measuring up, you know, what are those priority tasks and keeping on top of priority tasks because recruiters, we can massively get bogged down in, you know, all of the detail, not just our to-do lists, but everyone else's to-do lists. And you've got, you know, being pulled in all different directions from different stakeholders. So I imagine that would be really interesting to see how how much time is actually spent doing what is within the job description and should the job description be amended or should we be amending our, our ways of working I wonder yeah absolutely absolutely thank you for that and thank you for that point Tori much much appreciated and I think then, you know, I'm going to move us on to Boolean sourcing because this is the big one, right? This is finding the candidates that we wouldn't have otherwise found is so important that we really hone these these skill sets. And I think for any of you who've met with a job board or spent time with a job board, there are occasions, only occasions, there are occasions whereby sometimes the Boolean sourcing is delivered in such a way that it's made to be maybe more complicated than it is. It's made also to be, um, it's not necessarily delivered in a structured format as such. And by structured format, I mean, most recruiters want a nice little neat format to be able to create their searches and to really understand how to how to get the best out of them. Um, and I think I, um, I'm interested to know, and, and again, over to you, really, Hayley, what were your thoughts in terms of the response and the feedback from the Boolean searching sessions that, that, that we delivered? So I think this was the main focus area for me and probably the the most helpful for part of everything that we've done to, to upskill our recruiters is to give them time to understand how that works. Because what, as Joe says, you know, once you've created a, sh- a search screen, string, pardon me, put my teeth back in, it absolutely is so easy to replicate that, amend a few words, share that amongst other members in the team. If you've had a really successful search within a certain location, could that be transferable to, to other areas? I think it's just empowering the team to have a small session to understand how it's done and then just play around with it and have a bit of fun with it as well. Um, and I think that that, that for, for us has, has been really important um, to, to generate those additional leads coming into the business and, and I'm wondering in terms of in terms of being able to find those additional individuals ha, is that something that's that's been able to happen have you found that you've you've been able to to find people that you maybe wouldn't have found previously yeah absolutely and for us I think for for many years we had the luxury of being able to attract candidates solely based on our brand within the marketplace and it is a it is an ever-changing market as we know um, and that also doesn't necessarily mean that we're a you know, attaining the best candidates for the job as well, just because we, we've got applicants, whether we have or haven't got applicants, um, are they necessarily the, the best candidates? So I think getting the team to change that approach has been a real game changer and also changing the mindset of our, of our recruiters around that. So starting to direct source at the beginning of a process rather than just feeling that they have to kind of fall back on that if they're not able to, to fill the vacancy and, and as I said once we spent some time really talking the team through those search search strings um, and how to how to also engage with candidates after they've located them because it's all well and good reaching out to a passive candidate who might not know your company or you know they wouldn't have applied they would have applied if, if they knew that the role was available so it's um it's how they can talk those talk through with those candidates once they've identified them and I think once we were able to, to spend some time reflecting on that with the team, they immediately saw the value because they were able to find those candidates and engage with them. Um, we've had, uh, we actually track now the number of candidates that we directly source in, into the business. Um, and we, you know, we have weekly accounts of candidates being placed into the business that I wholeheartedly believe we wouldn't have otherwise found and have in our business now. So real mm-hmm. successes from, from Boolean searching and direct sourcing more generally. I think it's really interesting that, you know, not all recruiters are aware that on average there's 8,000 characters per search, 8,000 characters per search. 
And so oftentimes, you know, if we see uh, quite often when I go into work with organisations, um, I'll ask recruiters or their leaders to show us the searches that we're, we're operating. And oftentimes what we see is we've got multiple job titles, multiple skill sets and maybe competitor organisations that we'd like people to have come from. And that's it. So we end up with maybe only using two, three, four hundred characters. I think, you know, 400 characters and, and people are thinking, great, that's a really detailed search. Actually, it's nowhere near as detailed as we could get it. And it's about understanding how the databases work, how each individual databases work and actually what some of those search parameters will do for us if we understand how to utilize them. You know, and, and I think it's everything from the basics of what does an asterisk do? You know, the asterisk is on the keyboard above the number eight. Well, it finishes in every word that you search on. So if you wanted to search, for example, on manager, just put in manage and chuck the asterisk at the end and you'll end up with managing, managed, manager, makes it easier. But also to consider, sorry, Hayley, you were going to say I was, I was just going to say absolutely that the art of doing or, or, or making that search as, as long as possible and depending on what platform you're using, being able to save those as watchdogs because you, know, you don't have to do this every day. You can set it up so that the system does it for you. And if you know you've got tough to fill roles or the next time that role is going to come up, I'm going to have a lot of pain. You can absolutely get those systems to fire you across CVs as soon as they're registered and it's doing all of the hard work for you. Absolutely. And I think it was interesting that that certainly um, when when you talk to recruiters about, you know, what what are some of the alternative job titles and how do you find those alternative job titles? And then interestingly, what are the alternative spellings? You know, I ran a search yesterday on total jobs for a, a, a Unix engineer and I got 727 candidates. I ran a search for a Unix engineer and instead of spelling engineer in the correct fashion, I altered it and I changed it to N-E-G, so E-N-I-G-E-E-R. I got over 7,000. Now, what we know is, is that there are some candidates who will have put spelling mistakes in. And, and I was talking to um, somebody who does nothing but sourcing all day, every day. Um, and she was she was talking to me about, look, there are some candidates now who just put um, typos in to make sure that um, when a recruiter does find them, they've really done the work too. And so they're, they, you know, they're kind of, um, there's this real, I think, lack of enthusiasm now when we're contacted by a recruiter because if we're a candidate it's easy to find we probably get 10 calls a week um but I think the other thing is you know how often do we as individuals make mistakes well relatively often um and so if there are mistakes on CVs it means that we're missing out on finding the candidates who have made the mistakes but might be cracking at the role um and this was a real mindset shift wasn't it because I, I think this is where lots of people were were kind of concerned just to, oh, you know I can't I can't put somebody forward who might have made a mistake on the CV um and, and I think, you know, there, there was a mindset shift in terms of, well, actually, you know, it's not about it's it's not about their that what's on the CV. It's about who they are. And I think, you know, if, if this market's taught us anything, it's about transferable skills and understanding what people bring um, in terms of their value proposition. Absolutely. So go on, Hayley, I don't know if you're going to answer. I was agreeing. I was agreeing with you. You were agreeing. Okay, thank you. So I'm interested to know, as we work through, as you can see, there are, there are eight different um, programs that we offer, but I'm actually going to go to questions rather than talk you through all of the eight. So I'm interested to know what are the questions we've got? What would you like to know? What are the questions? There's no open questions at the moment, um, but I'm going to go to questions, but I'm also going to um, ask for Natasha, I think, just to just to chuck up for me. I think we had another poll, which I think we've got so busy talking that we didn't necessarily chuck up so I'm just gonna ask there we go so in terms of recruiting behaviors what which of the recruiting behaviors do you think could be improved within your organization so I'm just going to chuck that poll up um, and see what people's thoughts are we won't always know what are the recruiting behaviors that we want to change or up level but we might be aware that there's something that's happening along the journey. So it might be that you're finding that candidates are ghosting. Um, and my opinion of ghosting is that candidates don't ghost. They just choose to deselect themselves from the process. And they've done that based on maybe the overall impression of the organization, maybe the impression of the recruiter. Maybe there's an alternative role out there that's offering more of an EVP. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm just interested to know what are the recruiting behaviors that you think um, could be improved within within your organization um because again we can talk to some of these points just before we close off for, for the morning so um and by the way i'm quite happy for people to come off mute and i'm quite happy um for people to to check into chat as well if you'd like to it's absolutely fine okay 
So I think um, I think just as we're waiting for this poll to be completed, I think it'd be interesting just to talk to um, some of the points and just going back, Hayley, to, to the point that you talked about with your, um, there we go. So, um, so managing the hiring manager's expectations, but as well as gaining feedback post-interview. So actually nearly 60% said, look, gaining feedback post-interview. So I'm going to go and I'm just going to talk to that point. And if I can get to the others, then, then I will do. But let's just go to this point about feedback. Part of the education with the hiring managers is educating them that we have to have feedback, not just based on who they want to offer, but we really need feedback based on the other candidates that we've decided not to offer and the why. And part of that education is, of course, about explaining that we really want to keep candidates in the recruitment cycle. We want to keep them in the pipeline. We want to keep talent pools. And the only way to do that is to be able to get some really constructive feedback for candidates. Um, and Hayley, you were just about to say something. So I was just going to keep talking, but I'm over to you if you wanted to add. No, I, I, I... I think both of those points resonate with us. I think there's a, a couple of things that we implement to, to try and counteract this is if you can get out and meet the hiring manager face to face, if you're not based in, in the same office or at the same site and have those conversations early on to manage their expectations around what is required it makes it easier to push back on that at a later stage when you know you feel like you're having to hound to, to get feedback um and i think for us that that change in recruiters mindset around chasing our hiring managers as well and how tenacious they need to be with that um and we spent a lot of time uh, looking at the candidate journey and creating a seamless candidate journey and really painting that picture to our recruiters so that they could put themselves in the candidate's shoes to really understand what it feels like from a candidate's perspective if they're not getting feedback that that actually potentially damages our brand if we're just rejecting someone and not giving them any feedback from that interview so that they could really hammer that home with our hiring managers and, and set that scene and equally to the point that you made Joe around our silver medalists so that's absolutely something uh, that we track within the business it's all well and good saying okay I interviewed five people and I've hired one but perhaps that second person if the first person hadn't applied would have been offered the role and what more can we be doing to utilize that person in our wider business so I think it's it's, it's always going to be a difficult one we can't control people can we which is the biggest frustration of working in recruitment but to set those expectations up front with the hiring manager I think we found helps significantly absolutely I think excuse me to your point about setting those expectations there's also there's also some work to do to set the timelines with the hiring manager and right from the very start right at the point where we take down the role it's explaining the timeline and explaining who has responsibility for what during the process and also booking that feedback you know something that that I've found and, and an experience that I've lived worked breathed is to book those feedback sessions in straight after the interviews and have them as an expectation, right? They're a transactional part of this process as opposed to being an add-on and helping recruiters to be confident enough to book this in, whether it's Teams, whether it's on a call, whether it's on site, face-to-face, -face, but actually being able to book in that meeting so that we've got that feedback and also to use the nudge documents that we provide to really be able to ask your hiring managers those salient and core questions to be in a position to be able to deliver feedback, like you say, for those silver medalists that's then of value to them that they can work on that, that allows them to still believe that they could work for the organization and be very keen to do so um and what's completely gone out of my mind and sorry to do this Natasha can I just ask you what was um what was next I know we had a high percentage looking for um for feedback thank you for that um and then I guess so what's next then is again it's going back to managing the hiring managers expectations okay and again this all comes from the very start point of taking on the role so rather than taking the role creating a PO number if that's what you do internally getting the job advertised immediately, going back to the hiring manager when we have CVs. It's actually about the, the conversation and the management of the hiring manager right up front. And, and what we do is we give recruiters the relevant tools, the knowledge, the confidence, the behaviours to be able to have those conversations up front. So regardless as to whether the role's blue collar, white collar functions global, if the process is set and the global standards are set, and every team member knows what's required between the A to Z of recruiting, then we're in a position whereby we can really manage the hiring manager's expectations. 
And it comes down to having the confidence, the knowledge, but also understanding, you know, what's the criteria? What, what do we need to give our hiring managers for them to work with us in a partnership from a partnership perspective? Um, and I think, Hayley, this is something that, that we worked on um, really uh, for quite a while with them, um, with your, your recruiters. And I wondered if you just wanted to talk to that point just for a second in terms of managing expectations. Yeah, I think I think we we touched on it quite a bit throughout this, haven't we? It's yeah. just yeah. Um, finding out the the difference between what is a prerequisite in the role. So so realistically, what can we advertise and expect? That is a hundred percent what we need within the role, and what is then variable within that? What you know that give and take, as it were. And I think, um, as I said, it just it does come down to relationship management. And we have seen um, the more time that we spend with our hiring managers, um, the better that relationship becomes. Um, and it's the partner partnering as well. And I, I know I keep going on about that, but actually being seen as part of the same team, um, it enables you to, to have that influence level in a much more significant and meaningful manner in the same way that you know the the teams that we work in day in with day day out we probably tr- trust their judgment more than someone that you know is just at the end of the phone that every only calls every now and then so i think it is influencing throughout the whole process from from start to finish and and to your point joe setting those criteria around this is what you can expect from me and this is what i expect from you and sometimes it doesn't hurt to you know pull on those pain points a bit you know well we can't fill your role because we're not going to offer the role until you give us feedback for all of our candidates um you know actually you say you want this but this is what the market's saying throw some data at it you know you need there needs to be some flexibility here or we're never going to be able to fill these roles so it's that ongoing ongoing relationship management absolutely and and what we deliver is is the detail the knowledge the the how-to across every part of the recruiting cycle and, and the final offering is that is communicating the offer and actually overcoming the counter offer you know how many times do we get it to the line we get the offer and we're then in counter offer um, territory and actually it's really important that our recruiters understand how to handle the counter offer and actually how to handle that across every part of the candidate journey you know the counter offer doesn't just arrive um, quite often the candidate's already open to counter offers and alternative offers. So it's understanding what the candidate commitment is very early on in the journey. And it's understanding the communication and the processes and the questioning to ask right the way along so that we can actually help the candidate to really figure out, actually, is this role, is this role what they want? Because if it is, then great, they can carry on in the journey. Otherwise, it might be that we choose to help the candidate to be part of our pipeline for next time. Mm-hmm. So that we we actually so that we're in a position whereby we remove as many of those barriers. Um, and, and also, I think, you know, by the time you're talking to a candidate about statistics as to why you shouldn't take a counter offer, you've completely lost them anyway. They have that you've no longer got the buy in. So you've got to understand the behaviors right at the very beginning and be able to deliver the insights and really get under the skin of the candidate, each individual to really understand what's going on for them. And so that this offering that this half day is all about what does the counter offer really look like from a candidate perspective? And how do we really understand what's going on for them and what are those touch points with candidates on the journey? And I guess, you know, the whole offering is all about really making sure that we've got this very streamlined, this candidate experience, this that's actually that's effortless. Candidates should feel as though they've been really well looked after across the process. Um, and as you can see, I've just put um, a very small snippet of some of the feedback that, that we've had um, from recent trainings. Um, and I don't know, I know um, you can probably see on there that, that one of them, the top right, talks about a PLG, which is a peer learning group. And regardless as to the amount of time we've spent in the classroom, we will always spend some time in peer learning groups after the classroom, somewhere between uh, 24 and 48 hours later. And that's to maintain the legacy, right? Because 80 percent of everything we cover disappears the minute that we get back to our laptops, the minute we get back to our pile of CVs, the minute we get back to our hiring managers. So peer learning groups are just this great opportunity to maintain the legacy and to keep that knowledge and to keep that data, the data insights and to keep the processes and the methodology. 